Tay Tay. Yeah. I mean, this is the picture that we've basically been seeing on the Zoom screen over the past little mix, isn't it? Yeah. So nice, nice to meet you with some of you face to face anyway. Um, and I'm going to introduce you to my colleague and the moment who's going to give you the privilege of being with this morning. But first of all, just to say there have been no tutorials this morning. Um, Brian is a, is a way, Paul was meant to be taking the tutorials and he's grown up so he's just sick. I don't know if you know where he's going to go. And he's ended up back in New Zealand, terrible. So what we're going to do is I've put the, you know, the tasks that we put in your collaboration groups on campus so you can go and you can go and work in that classroom, you know, the tutorial classrooms are free for you to go work in. You work with your groups if they're here, but you can go into that collaboration site on campus and do your work and you love what you do for the last 11 weeks. And you're most welcome to join us on Thursday at 5.30 on the International Drop-In Zoom. Okay, so I go over everything again as well. So, um, and then we've got one more week after this, and so next week I'll be focusing on preparing for the exam. And if you're already starting to think about the exam, you're so excited about having exam because you come up, um, just go back through your tasks, because you'll get everything that we do is that coherent story about what is it about teaching um, that links to the stories, okay? So just remember that's the key thing with this course. Has anyone got any questions before I go and sit down? Okay, give me a wave, that's so funny. Give me a heart, I oh, know you can't do that. Ah, uh, right. <laughs> right, so I'm going to um, introduce you to my lovely colleague and friend, Jamie Denter, who I've been working with, oh gosh, for the last at least five years, isn't mm. it? Maybe longer now. And uh, he's such a whiz, and such a, he's been such a, well, he's been blessing in this time of COVID, um, because I can just go to him with my questions about some strategies using virtual learning spaces and he's always there and he's doing some fabulous fabulous work um, and I thought wow what a great opportunity for you to also engage with some of the thinking around teaching and using with and through technology mm. so enjoy this morning I'll just check that's working yeah so kia ora everyone um, thank you Esther as uh, Esther said, my name is Jamie Denton, so uh, called Jamie Denton, Toko Ingwa. Um, I'm a, I have a couple of different roles at the university. One is I work at the what we call Ranga Ahoako, which is the university's central learning and teaching design team. So that team works with lecturers to help get technology enhanced learning into their teaching and to help them redesign their courses, redesign their spaces. So not often... I'm in with students, usually working directly with lecturers, but the other part of my role is as a PhD student, so, and with Esther as one of my supervisors, and my PhD work is looking at teacher identity through when they're integrating technology into their teaching space. So I'm going to be using a bit of both hats when, when talking to you today. A little bit of, I'm kind of hearing myself really loudly over that, and that's annoying me having a bit of both, both of those sort of hats to talk to you today. And what we're going to... Oh, that's not, not working for me. Why is that? Oh, there we go. Uh, might, be, might do about three now. <laughs> so the, the whakatoki, the small whakatoki on the screen is kind of going to guide us a little bit today that what it's saying there is we, we look backwards to move forward. So looking backwards, reflecting, and then we move forward is a very brief or simple English translation of, of that. I think I might just be too far away from it. There we go. Oh, yeah. um, what we're going to do is there's going to be a little bit of a couple of activities I'm going to get you to do, which I've already put into Canvas. They're not necessarily published at the moment, and we'll publish them as we go. But if you can, while we're just getting sorted, jump into the Canvas course for this, for this uh, Canvas site for this course, and just be on there with it, with your device. And then when we get to those bits, you'll see a poll pop up and or something, and I'll just direct you to them. Okay? So just make sure you can get on and get sorted. And what you'll also see 
is this morning I published what's called an H5P module, which has basically everything we're going through today, not as lecture slides, but as a whole bunch of different activities and different interactive ways, um, including some writings that I've done previously around technology, my own pepeha, a little bit about myself, and different, different ways of engaging with the content. So that's sitting there as well. And if you want later on, I'll put these slides on, but mostly that content's already in that H5P module, and that's probably the better way to engage with it. Sorry? So we go to week 11 module? Yeah, so go into the week 11 module. And we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, so just keeping that on screen. And while that's on screen and while you're having a little look at it, I'll just uh, kind of give you my position when it comes to technology. And we're, obviously we're talking about teaching with and through technology today. But where I come from with it, is it's another tool in your teacher's toolkit. Okay, it's not the be all and end all. It's not going to be everything should be done through technology, but it's, it's something that we can use. And if the circumstances dictate that it's gonna be something that can add value for the students and provide new opportunities and new experiences, then why not use it as a tool? That's kind of how I come from a very pragmatic approach. If I'm teaching and I can do the same thing with a piece of paper, I'm going to use a piece of paper rather than an electronic piece, uh, electronic bulletin board or discussion, whatever. But if I can get more out of my learners by doing something using technology, then I'm going to be an absolute pragmatist and just use the technology and try to get that extra out of them. Okay, so a bit of history like from, from me, where I came from, which is that, that slide before. So my journey was I started off, I was trained as a secondary school teacher through the University of Auckland. Uh, decided, uh, nah, not, not really for me. So I went back to uni again, carried on and did a master's and then started teaching at a tertiary institute down in the Waikato. So I was teaching, lecturing down in sport and exercise science down in Wintech. Did that for a couple of years and then went over to Canada, took up a role over there um, in a sports medicine clinic, teaching stuff there as well, before coming back and taking up the, my old job again, lecturing down at Wintech again. Somewhere along the line when I came back, it became more about what I was teaching, sorry, more about how I was teaching the ways I was teaching than what I was teaching. I got a lot more fascinated in how can I teach and how can I get best out of my students rather than what is the content I am teaching. So that kind of led me astray off into the education side and led me towards a Masters of Education and then into the work I'm currently doing. So part of my experience of how can I get the best out of my students was how can I use digital technologies or modern technologies to get the best out of my students. So some of the stuff we were doing there was in an anatomy lab. Yes, they've got the bone they can look at, but how can we do it so that they're using their cell phone, scanning that, and then seeing that in place on an, on an athlete, see it moving, see it working, see all those things that we couldn't normally do just by seeing it normally. Or how can we show someone what it looks like when it breaks? You know, we don't get to see what a bone looks like when it breaks because it's inside a human body. So how can we show through animation what it actually looks like when it snaps so we can learn how to heal it better? So we're going to go through a couple of different things, four different tales today, because the paper is called Tales and Traditions, so I thought we'd do it through tales. And what I thought we'd start with is where were we before the pandemic hit? I think we've done a, you guys have done a little bit of this and some of it might resonate a little bit with about a week or two ago. Okay, but we may take this from a slightly different angle. Okay. So I'm gonna start with a little bit of a story. I was born in 1975, the same year that this thing came out. Okay? This thing was the world's first commercially available precursor to a laptop. 
Okay? That's the screen. Okay? It can hold 16 lines of text, no images, just text, in green only, and it can only have 64 characters across each line. Its only memory is this tape. Okay? The thing weighed 25 kgs to carry around. It was about this big, and it would cost you about 20 grand US to buy it. Okay? So, pretty ridiculous if we're calling that a laptop. But it's the start of where we, where, where we started heading. Okay? And that's back in 1975. My niece, my youngest niece, she's born in 2008. Okay? She came into a world where the MP3 file format, which is what started all of the digital file transfers for music, started streaming, started all of that stuff, that had been around for about 15 years already by the time she was born. Okay, Facebook had been around for about four years by the time she was born. YouTube, three years by the time she was born. iPhones, a year before she was born. Okay, so in that short, what I like to think of as a, as a short time, yeah, in that one generation, me to her, so, you know, this is my brother's, my brother's daughter, so we're talking one generation. We've seen this massive technology revolution Okay, anything on screen you're going to get later, so just take notes as you, as you want. But we've seen this massive technology revolution where what was a massive 25 kg thing that could barely show anything has now become incredibly portable and simple, has, even down to the, you know, that kind of size where we can start consuming media audio, video, everything's through here. And it's totally changed everything about the way we do things. Okay? It's disrupted the way we consume media. I don't know about you guys, but I'll watch a few videos on my phone. Yeah? Previously, when I was a kid, you had to watch it on the TV. You didn't have the option of go out into the garden and watch a video. It just didn't exist. It wasn't an option. But the thing that I find really fascinating is that when I was a kid, they chose what I watched. Okay, there was only so many channels, and the people de developing that content said, at 7 o'clock, you're going to watch this show, or this show, or this show. But now, your, you know, your generation, Izzy's generation, you're deciding what is on the media, when you consume it, how you consume it, where you consume it, just through what you're interacting with and how you're interacting with it. And even when we look at old style media, so this is the news from 2018, we're seeing this massive influx of technology being used in really standard media forms. Yeah. It's not good enough anymore just to talk about the petrol prices. How, re how relevant is that right now? But to talk about petrol prices, we've got to have cars floating in. You know, we've got to have all this augmented reality happening because we've totally revolutionised everything we're doing. Okay, but I want to stop for a second and I want to go to this next piece and this should pop up on the screen hopefully in a second. Come on. Why is that not coming up? There we go. And I'm going to publish the first bit on Canvas. And what I want you to think about, and if you're near someone, have a moment to think and then talk to the person beside you. What technologies have you seen or used in education before the pandemic? Okay, so before 2020, in your education, what kind of technologies did you use? So you had to refresh that page. So, so yeah, so when you get in here, you're going to type into where it says type your answer, and you've only got 40 characters, so just a quick word, hit submit, and it will, we're going to create like a word cloud here. So if somebody else puts a word in, just put your word in as well. It will get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay? And if anyone's put anything in already, I'll be able to refresh it and see. Do we just keep a poll? Do we have a submit? 
Yes, yeah, so it should be under poll one in Canvas. Yep. So I'm here. Ah. Uh, can just, is this the app? Yeah. Have you got courses? Um, can you access your courses? Just right one and submit the number one. I normally go just through the website, so I normally go oh, to. Okay. So that's the app. Yeah, I normally go to canvas.auckland.ac.nz. Oh, okay. And then just going through that way. Okay. This group's really quiet. Normally this is really noisy. Feel free to make some noise. Sorry, what was that? Canvas. .auckland.ac.nz. Let's see what sort of things you've seen or you've used. And that can be as a student or as a teacher if you've had that experience. Hello. Cool, so we've got some stuff starting to pop up. <laughs> so, sorry, I just saw something come in. If you go into Canvas, you can go into Canvas and go into the modules for this week, and then go into Poll Technologies, Experience, and Education. And Jamie's got a little participation activity that we're involved in. Anyone got questions yep. for Jamie to go through? Are you able to access? Uh, okay, we'll, we'll probably only just another minute or so and then we'll head on anyway. So let's go 30 seconds, get, get your last ones in. And I'll stop you there. So let's have a look at what we've got. And you're probably easier to read it on your own screen than you are on the, the projector, just because that's quite small. But we're seeing, what kinds of things are we seeing here? A lot of um, technologies where you're writing into something, right? So I'm seeing like Office, so I'm guessing like Word, Excel, that sort of stuff. Uh, some hardware, Chromebook, laptops, Yep, Padlet, OneNote. Cool. Great. Okay, thank you. We're going to come back to that in a little bit. And we're actually going to pause here for a minute. So just what I want you to think on is, yeah, the landscape of where technology was versus where was technology in education at that time, pre-pandemic. Okay? And so... Let's have a little bit of a look at our second story. And this is the history of educational technologies leading up to sort of our modern times. Um, and this is, when I first started my PhD, I was, looking, I was going to be looking at identity of learning designers, instructional designers, those people that are behind the scenes working with these educational technologies. And that led me down a little bit of a rabbit hole that Esther said I could go down which was looking at, <laughs> it was like, just go, you're going to do it anyway, so you might as well just go, which was, where did these technologies come from? Where did these people come from? Where did this information come from? Okay, and so I thought, okay, where did all of these technologies, where did all this information, what's, what's the background to all of this? Okay, and I got really interested in, and you've got, this timeline is actually already sitting on 
inside that H5P module I told you about earlier, so you've got access to it already. But I got really interested in a, a few things that were sitting here. And one of the things I found was back in 1890, there was reports of this thing called a magic lantern that was being used in classrooms in the US. Okay, so this magic lantern, I got kind of curious about that, so, but I thought, we'll, we'll, we'll hold that, we'll come back to it in a minute. Okay, and then 1905, what are they using? Slides, films, so video, obviously not with audio at that time, charts, study, prints, other materials. 1910, video, instructional film. Okay, so video content. 1913, Thomas Edison saying, forget the book, it's pointless. Wow, he got that wrong. So, so wrong. Okay, we're not gonna need books anymore because we're gonna teach everything through movies, through the motion picture, through the video. And that was back in 1913 and our school system will be completely changed in the next 10 years, okay? 1925, and this one I was really interested in, a teaching machine, a thing that can teach you without needing a person. So what was it? So I created this thing that was multi-choice questions, okay? Whoa, that sounds like Canvas quizzes. Revolutionary. <laughs> How far we've gone, okay? But what, what Presley, did, uh, Presley did was went, if you're doing this quiz and you get the wrong answer, let's say the right answer is A, but you've put in D, you don't get to move on until you put A. Okay? And saw that there was a learning effect. So went, hey, we can teach people without needing a person. How effectively? That's up for debate. Because really... It was a one in four chance. Yeah, and it's, you're just going, it wasn't D, is it C? No, is it B? No, is it A? Yes, move on. But it did see this learning effect. But 1925, that's 100 years ago. Yeah, multi-choice questions being used. Anyway, I'm not making any comment. <laughs> 1940 to 1945, we're at World War II. Okay, and this I found absolutely fascinating. The US military had this problem that they had to train all the people at home that were making materials, and they had to train all the people that were in different parts of the world on new ways of, you know, the ways that they wanted them to involve in combat and the ways they wanted them to make these materials. So how are they gonna do it? They decided, well, we'll, we'll do it through video, We'll send out videos, we'll send them out to all these different places, they can watch the video, learn from the video, and there you go. Okay, and so they, they made about 400 of these videos, and there was 4 million screenings of these videos, and the Germans themselves believed that that was one of the reasons that there may have been, yeah, they, they weren't ready for how quickly the US could get this through. Hey, what happened in, the last, in 2020? How did we teach you, everyone? Through video, right? <laughs> oh, that's a revolutionary idea. We weren't doing that in 1940. <laughs> 1952. 242 TV channels given for education. It's, let's use TV. That might be a cool idea. And so they started, this is in the US, they started thinking, let's, let's start using TV. Maybe we can create some TV opportunities. And then into 1960 odd, they started looking at the idea of, what if we had a lecturer in a, in a university or in a college talking to their students, and that's recorded by CCTV and beamed to these, these educational channels, and the people at home can watch this lecture, and then they could learn from it. Okay, so this is 1960. Does that sound familiar? 
Or am I just being really like facetious right now? 1965, they decided that was a really bad idea because the production quality of these educational TV things wasn't that interesting. They said that having a lecturer simply de deliver a lecture and there's no interactivity, no, nothing for the person watching it at home is a really poor way to learn. Okay, 1965. Okay, so what's that quote? If we don't learn from history, we're, gonna, we're doomed to repeat it. So, you know, they're saying we need to be doing this interactivity. Okay? Uh, and I'm going to skip through there. But yeah, so there's a couple of things I found really fascinating in that. One was how much of our modern education was based on a need to get information out during the war and to train people during the war, and how much of what we do is haunted by that moment, to use Esther's one of her favourite words, that haunting of how do we train people at bulk and also this idea of these magic lanterns. I was like, what are these things? Okay, so I dug into them a little bit more. And this is a picture from 1671. Okay, the candle on here going through a tube. That's a little slide with an image on it which gets projected on a wall. 1671. Okay? It gets shrunk down by 1889, but the idea is still the same, right? It's still a light going through it. The, now the image slide is in here, and it still projects out here. What's that thing up there doing? So, 1671, we're still using technologies from that started in that sort of time. Okay? So, and here you go, mid 19th century, a lecture happening using a magic lantern. Now, remember, tale one, we we're talking about how technology's revolutionised our world. I'm not seeing a lot different from that versus me if I had a stick. Yeah, there's not a lot of change happening there. So, so that's the kind of the history of where we've kind of come from. So, yeah, if we're looking back at tail one, where were we in 2019 compared to you know, for technology integration in education compared to the rest of the world? Yeah, where, where were we? And this is a quote from 2005, which says, in education, the use of modern technologies is relatively low, typically focused on narrow range of applications, word processing, so Word, Google Docs, uh, video, YouTube, uh, Panopto, network conferencing, Zoom, Skype, Email, I guess we could maybe add instant messaging to that, and the internet being used a bit more sparsely. So let's pull up your responses again. Sorry, this live content takes a little bit of time to pull up. And have a little bit of a think. So the last quote was 2005. And I was asking you about 2019. So that's quite a time difference again. Okay, so thinking about your experiences and the experiences that Simon Priestley were talking about, I'm just going to, oh, how do I, oh, have I already given you access to this? Yeah. Oh. Is this already published? No, the other. No, this is, um, sorry, I'll go, jump into Canvas and just publish this quickly.
So there should be another thing now. I just want you to have a quick think and just jot, jot a couple of notes down. And I, um, actually, I will. Why not? I'll publish the timeline, but what I want you to do is jump into that Google Doc that's called Compare and Contrast Your Experiences with Simon Priestley's Observations. And there's a thing on there that's going to ask you to just... So just kind of think about how your, your experiences in 2019 may be different or the same as what they talked about in, 20, in 2005. Just jot a couple of little notes, nothing major. We'll just take about maybe five, ten minutes on this. So similar to what you did, similar to what you did with uh, Tanisha's past last week, respond to... Sim, 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 and Priestley's quote from 2005. Yeah. Experience the same or different? Different in what ways? Yeah. Yeah. And did you find a picture? So go, go back into modules. So, in, so if you go into modules, there should be a new page that's just been published, which is like compare and contrast or something? As a MR model. Sorry? It's on, it's on, you might need to refresh your page mm. because he's just published it. So it's a week of even module teaching with, and through technology. Go down to activity, yep. compare yeah. and contrast. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. So is your experience different than what they're saying, or is it the same? If it's different, how is it different? Seeing a lot of curses going in there, but not seeing a lot of writing going in there. Are you writing in there? Please. No one's writing yet. <laughs> there we go. Now we've got some writing. Good. Yay. That's it. Anonymous Python, what a cool name. And if you've got any questions, just shout out and I'll pop over.
Ooh, just another minute or so. Just finish up your thought on there. Excellent. Thank you. So I'm going to leave that there for you as well, but there's some really fascinating thoughts that are coming up um, around the way that the technology has been used, the fact that we're using technology in high... We're using it all the time, but the ways in which we're using it is a lot of sort of... I'm seeing a comment around sort of video conferencing, word processing still being used a lot, but that being integrated with sort of things like Google Docs, Google Drive, which automatically saved, you take that hassle out. Um, a lot of access to quick research, being able to access everything through online. So, um, yep, options of complete online experiences and whether or not, yeah, whether they are um, less engaging at the moment, yes, probably they are. Um, use of technology devices collaborating in real time, etc. So I'm going to skip one of my slides because I don't think I need to beat you over the head with the same idea over and over. Which, and we're going to move into here, which is a bit of a. I want to look at this model, which is the SAMR model. And first off, we're not going to use this in. And it's not designed to be used to evaluate um, and give, like, this is better than this. It's not that kind of model. It's not to say that everything should try and fit into this box, but it's a good way of trying to categorise and understand where things fit. Okay? And this is really to do with how technology is integrated into learning experiences. So there's these four categories, and... You've got your substitution, which is at the very top, and that is around just taking something using a direct substitute but not changing anything. So instead of giving you a piece of paper in class, putting it on Canvas and you download it from there. Nothing has changed. You've still got to read that piece of paper. It's just now in digital format rather than a paper format. Okay, so that's just pure substitution. Augmentation would be um, augmenting it. There's a direct substitution, but we're changing little bits and pieces of it. So, for instance, um, instead of giving a paper-based quiz, we could use Kahoot. Okay, so there's a little augmentation to it. Everyone's used Kahoot? Yeah? Uh, basically, like a quiz question will come up, you'll put your answer on your phone, and it's a little bit of game, gamey. You get kind of funny noises, beeps, etc. But really, it's not that much different than just asking a question, getting you to write it down, or put your hand up. It's not that significantly different. In the modification, 
we're now getting into places where the task can be re redesigned because of using technology. Okay, so this could be something like um, using a Padlet to do online um, collaborative online brainstorming where you're not physically all in the same place. Okay, if it was that you're going to do brainstorming when you're all in the same place, that's probably just augmentation. Okay, but if you're not in the same physical space, then I'm modifying how you can work and how you can do things. Redefinition, totally new tasks can be created because of technology being incorporated. So for instance, if we were teaching an art history class, we could do a virtual, a virtual tour to Florence. Go over a walk around the streets using 360 you know, Street View on Google or um, <laughs> playing Assassin's Creed games. They've done this beautiful reconstruction of those areas. Yeah, you've got to kill a few people on the way, but that's education, right? When have you not had to kill a few people in education? Um, but yeah, this reconstruction, you, we can't just fly you over to Florence and see what it looked like in the 1500s. But we can, through the technology, drop you in there. Or we could do something like take a, um, be working with a particular text and zoom the author in one day. And you can ask questions of the author, which could not be possible in other ways. OK, so just wanted to bring this up. As I said, it's not f about everything should be redefinition. We're not always trying to do that. Sometimes the best thing is substitution. Sometimes the best thing is augmentation. But we do have these options, and understanding where different things fit can help you start going, what am I trying to do? What do I want my learners to do? How do I want this to work? Am I using the tool in the way that I can use it and appropriately? So if I'm doing things that would allow me to work in this space, but I'm only using them for th activities that do this, my students are going to be really frustrated because they're going to be sitting there going, oh, you could do so much cool stuff with this. You know, but you're just not. You just haven't quite made that bar that we can see some really cool stuff happening. You know, or vice versa, if I'm saying, hey, let's get really immersive. Let's drop into this totally new world. Let's go back to the pyramids in Egypt and study them. But let's not use Assassin's Creed Odyssey or whichever one it was that was in the pyramids. I can't remember. Let's just look at a textbook. Well, that's not immersive. If I've suggested we're going to have this immersive experience, then let's, let's use it to be immersive. Okay? So where would you put some of your experiences thus far? Just have a think. Call out a couple of you. If you can think about it. I wonder, um, with that redefinition one, James, I like the way that you took it back to the gaming world, because as you know, my family are all gamers as well. Mm. Is there anyone in here who also does gaming online? Um, we do online gaming. We do. I was going to say, I can't be the only person in this room, man. Come on. I can't be any dude that goes home and shoots zombies. Come on. Would you, would you, what's your name, sorry? Uh, James. James? When Jamie talks about the... Oh, two James. Yeah, it's a J thing. <laughs> James and the game people. Um, when, Jay, when Jamie talks about redefinition and, and the game world that you are involved in, would you, would you think it would fit into that one there where you can do tasks in that space that, yeah. One of the main ones that people are using quite a lot is Minecraft. But it's getting overused. It's getting kind of boring. That, yeah. Yeah. What about um, the task we've just done? Where I got you working on a Google Drive, a Google Doc in here. Where would we put that? Is 
Uh, sorry, what was that? Yeah, I, th I think we could probably argue close in here. I'd just put it more up here. Yeah. I would think it could also fit into modification that it would mm. demand something different. What, what might we, how might it fit into modification? Um, if it was a bit like here where you're accessing things online and then bringing them in and putting it on the platform. Yeah, I'm not sure if people would have heard what you just said, so I'm just going to repeat it. So um, what we said was how we can move it into modification would be if we did it like a Padlet where you're bringing other media into it, like dropping images or videos or other things in there could move it in. What other ways could we have moved that task into modification? Thoughts? I'm thinking of Thursday nights when I've got my online students. Yep. They're all around the globe, right? South, um, South America, Singapore, China, and, and, and Australia. I could go into your Google Docs that you've created here, and they could then all come in and collaborate in that space, couldn't they? Yep. Would it shift into modification? Yeah, because they can't do it without the technology. Yeah. And that's, so if, all, if everyone here was... <laughs> I'm, Back in lockdown, we could do that task and reconnect and be doing something in real time, which we couldn't do in lockdown without the technology. So then, because we're stuck in that lockdown, it would become a modification. But like, if we had a student who was beaming in via Zoom for some reason, they could be experiencing it as a modification for them. And for us, it could be just sitting in that augmentation space. Yeah. Does that, as a framework, how does, how does that sit with you? Is there any questions about it? Does it make sense? Yeah? So in, in lockdown, not just out of the teaching, I think that redefinition one is really interesting. What are some other ways that technology in lockdown allowed you to do particular tasks that would have otherwise been inconceivable? What did you manage to achieve in lockdown because of technology that would otherwise have been inconceivable? Well, the universe, the, the last semester, the whole SA and like, learning couldn't happen without another thing. Mm. Yeah. You couldn't come here with another thing. So it's another big thing. Yeah. We were able and to study and to keep sure that. Yeah, that continuation of study in a pretty extreme time. I saw these really cool music videos that people do, like these, you know, really famous musicians around the world and get together and perform a piece and create it online. It was mm. just amazing. And there's no way that you couldn't have done that without the redefinition. No, and you've just reminded me that I got bored in lockdown, so um, some of my friends and I recorded a song. One was based in Fatianga, one was based in Wellington, and I was based in Auckland. We did the drums in Fatianga, never saw the guy. <laughs> I did the bass in Auckland, guitarist was in Wellington. And then we just mixed it, I think it got mixed in Fatianga, and then released. Right. And we never were in the same space, so. Yeah. We're going to see that song in the yeah. <laughs> okay, so. Now let's, let's jump a little bit into our third, our third one. How the lockdown and the pandemic shifted things up. Okay? So one of the things that we've got to be quite um, forthcoming when acknowledging straight up is just the speed at which if we go back and we try to remember 2020, I don't know, I've blocked this out, I've maybe had to go through therapy to remember some of this stuff, I'm not sure, but some of this, if you look at the time frame between first COVID patient being seen in New Zealand to our full alert level four locked in your house and not able to leave, we're talking less than a month. 
It's pretty quick pace. And one of the fascinating things is in terms of education, and if we're looking at tertiary space now, the speed at which we had to move from face-to-face -face learning into purely online learning, like you were saying just before, was just incredible, that pace, in that March 21st was when we said, oh, yeah, the Prime Minister came out and said, we're going to have a four-alert four system, a four-level system. The 23rd, oh, yeah, we're going to have to move into a... We have to step it up a bit. And the 25th, everyone's at home. So we're in a number of days only. And I was in the experience at the time of trying to help a lot of the faculties get used to and get ready for what, what's this world going to be? And on the 23rd, and this was uh, a journal entry I put in on the 23rd, remembering the 25th is when we went into lockdown. 23rd, we were just thinking, how are we going to physically distance our students in a lecture theatre? That's all we were worried about. So I'd run a workshop for two hours around how are we going to teach people when we can't get everyone in that theatre? And how are we going to teach those that can't come in? How are we going to do that? And halfway through that workshop is when Level 4 got announced. So we just stopped and we went, OK, let's just rerun the whole two hours and work out how the hell we're going to do this. OK, but it was very much a, we've got 60 hours to rethink education completely. From face-to-face, -face, fully face-to-face, -to, -face, to fully online, no face-to-face -face whatsoever for an institution like the university, which didn't, it didn't go into that blended space. It wasn't interested in that. It was a face-to-face -face world. That's all we did. OK, so it was a really fascinating, fascinating bit. So the advice that we put out, and this is from a book chapter that myself and my other supervisor have, are putting out, which is looking at how do you best prepare for those kind of events. Um, what did we do? Like most of the places in the world, we just stripped everything back as far as we could. What's the minimum things that we can achieve to still get education to occur and for continuation of education? Okay, and so most of you wouldn't have been here in 2020, but it was very, and you would have experienced it at high school or something similar. But what it was was very much a, we go right back to the absolute basics of videos recorded and put online. 1940 45 American US war effort. We went right back to there in our approach. Okay, and so. By, and remember, this was, 9, uh, this was March 25th this happened. By about March 27th, we already had people, like academics saying, that are used to working in educational technology, saying this is not online learning, this is not educational technology, this is something new, this is something different. So within two days, they're already publishing, saying this is not normal, this is unusual. And so they started calling it this emergency remote teaching rather than online learning to try and differentiate between the two, and suggesting that what we needed to do was what we've got on screen here, which is, and this will be interesting to see how we actually went out with it, because this was proposed in March 2020, was drop everything right back to just sort of video only or online Zoom style teaching. Let's do that for about four to, three to four weeks, I think we maybe messed up that timeline a little bit. After a month, let's start getting things back in around equitable access to computers. So let's start getting things in like transcripts you know, for hearing disabled students. Well, I don't think that happened in two years. Let's start getting academic integrity issues back in, all of these things. And then by August, let's start thinking about how we can prepare to teach students fully online for an entire term if we need to. Okay, so unfortunately we got stuck here for quite a long time. Mm. Okay, and what we're planning to do is try to jump. But we got very much 
it's stuck in here. But what it did, and I know it shook up a lot of people, including all the learners, but, and I put up the, as a reading, this wonderful reading that Esther, Esther had written with Gabriella Foreman Brown that if you get a chance to read it, have a, have a read through. It's all around how teacher identity shifted during that time. And I've pulled a few quotes out from Esther here around what it did with the teachers. Putting us all into a global context of vulnerability, uncertainty, and risk. Changing almost everything about how we teach and changing around what we consider our existing expertise and creating ambiguous boundaries and purposes around teaching and learning. Okay. How did, that, how did it feel from a learner perspective? Was it kind of similar? How did it feel? A lot of you were studying at that time. Throw out, some, throw out some words. What, what did it feel like? What were some of the adjectives of 2020, being thrown into that world? If you were in there or if you were working, what did it feel like to have everything uprooted on you? Confusion. Confusion? Fear, uncertainty. Yep. Yeah, just it was a lot of confusion because um, well, it was my first year and I was hard enough trying to find out how to get into university. So, mm. yeah. so you you were studying at the time? I was just uh, starting. Studying. Yeah. Oh, great time to start. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Anyone else? So we've got sort of confusion, fear. What other kind of words have we got associated with it? Yeah, for me, because I'm not like a technology that I, I was just with my kids trying to take him out all the time to the <laughs> too many videos and then I was studying and I was like oh I have to do everything and it was shocking I have to learn really learn and even that everything for example in canvas looks so easy if you don't know it at the beginning even that it's just a link mm. I don't know, I miss out so many things at the beginning. I was starting also my first semester last, the, like, the last semester, the one before. And it was, I just had, or maybe we just had like a four weeks present, and then the rest, and I, I didn't find I miss out many things until I got like, after a month, just pressing everything, and trying to find everything. It's shocking. Mm. It's still, softwares and programs are amazing. Like, everything is easy. You find it. But, but it, I'm still, the Zoom was, it's quite useful. It's, mm. But I still, this yeah. part is. But, so it sounds like you're kind of leaning towards that boundaries and purposes have changed as well. Yeah, how to how to navigate education had changed for you. But, um, if I'm hearing you correctly. Children, for example, the experience I have like many different ages, like different ages, and of course the pencil of age mm. is quite different. I don't know. I think the hardest part for my kids were the teenager one. Actually, he was he's fourteen or he was fourteen a year ago, and then. I don't know, like the connection mm. or the, at that <coughs> time or even younger is quite more, I mm. think it's more needed. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, lonely, not connecting. Yes. Yep, what else? Come on, you guys are quiet. Just, I know it's early, but come on. Just um, complete jarring isolation. And I was in my first year at uni as well. And yeah, I went from like feeling like I had a group of very like-minded individuals for the first time in my life, mm. like probably seven of us or something, and 
just to being completely disconnected from them and having to try and navigate those new relationships online and, and, and yeah, no longer being around those like-minded individuals. It took away my motivation and connection to what I was really, um, yeah, what I found out that I was connecting to, you know, in person. Mm. Yeah, because you just started getting connected to that group and then you pulled away from it as well. Yeah. Thank you for sharing. What else? Anyone else? What about that vulnerable word? That mm. came up a lot in the literature that Gabriella and I read, probably you've seen it as well. Yeah. How will we found vulnerable when we went into lockdown with your, you know, your... your Identity as a student. Um, so I do a lot of identity work, you know, so the whole space of who am I as a student, and it, and it, it was confusing in that sense of how I, how I be a student in lockdown. Do you want to feel that? Yeah? Yeah. I'm like, it was just glad, like, it just really felt the same. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It was it was a strange strange time. I went from yeah, working in an office at the university to working in my garage. Yeah. Yeah. Having shut the doors because my wife who works as a travel agent and somehow still works as a travel agent, I don't know how, was on phone calls beside me. So I'm like, I'm sorry. I love you, but shut up. <laughs> I need to do my own thing right now. So I'm closing you out. <laughs> yeah, everything was shut. Everything got shaken up. You know, suddenly, you know, what was I'm going to be? You know, trying to be really super professional and things. Oh, sorry, my cat just turned up in the Zoom call. Um, deal with it. It's not going to change. You know, <laughs> it, it, he's not going to go away. Yeah, everything changed. The whole, the whole world sort of changed on us, and it was quite jarring. It was quite, quite sh- put us in some really vulnerable, uncertain, risking spots. Yeah, I just want to add to your idea about identity. Um, I feel like since it was all online, I felt like it, I should have been completely immersed in my education, and that should have been, I, I just should have been like the most student I could possibly be. But because I didn't have the choice, with like all of the things that I could be doing in my life, I didn't feel like I was choosing to be a student. Mm. And I didn't feel like I was stepping into that identity. I felt like I was like that was the only option. That was just my surroundings. Didn't have any other yeah, any other choice. Thrown into it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know about anyone else, but I just felt like I was looking at you know social media and seeing all my you know, all my friends who work in sort of the trades going, oh, I'm going to take up yoga or something. I'm like, yeah. screw you, I'm still working. <laughs> yeah. I want to find myself over these four weeks. Yeah. But I was going to try and hold it all together somehow. That's right, the, that's something else you noticed, wasn't it? The, the very, very different experience that people had. And for us, it, would, it really um, showed um, the, the inequitable as well. mm. but there's another piece that I really loved in, in that article is and we're going to start looking at this in a little bit in a second which was around this this idea that for the teacher and this will probably resonate for the student as well that the pandemic caused the quickest transformation of pedagogical practices ever seen yeah, we were still using 1940s stuff. We were still using magic lanterns from 1678. Yeah, suddenly we had to throw ourselves into this whole new world. Like, we're, education is a very traditional old lumbering beast. Um, and usually when you talk about technology, and I'm quite surprised so far, usually some very grizzled old professor jumps in and goes, yeah, the pen's the oldest technology. And it's like, yeah. Probably the rock or the stick is, but sure. Uh, yeah, but yeah, and educators and I'd say students were not ready 
to deliver or receive high quality instruction remotely, but educators definitely not ready to, do, to produce education in that way. And what we've acknowledged here and what Esther and Gabriella have acknowledged is that rapidly shifting to online teaching is not about simply moving what works in the face-to-face -face world onto the screen. You need these new technologies, you need new ways of connecting, like you were saying, you know, you can't just, just sitting behind the screen, you feel really disconnected. We need to find ways of connecting our groups still and building community, even if that community is not together. And we couldn't do that during the pandemic, but we can in normal times. Um, but there was also this forced readiness to teach online. So one of the things I was really fascinated with when I was reading it, and it pulled back a, a model that I'd remembered from about 2006, and this is called the TPAC model, which is around how, how teachers can start to integrate technology and the things they need to know about and how it can be potentially problematic in places and where the, where the friction points can be in bringing in technology into your practice. And so the model itself looks a bit confusing, but it essentially comes down to you got these two, these, sorry, these three primary knowledges. I know Brian has probably pulled apart the word knowledges, but sorry. No, that's good, because you're drawing on two of them and you're introducing another knowledge. Yeah, and then you've got these three, three secondary knowledges and this tertiary knowledge. So what we've got at the primary knowledge level, content knowledge, so the teacher needs to know their material, their content, their subject, their discipline, okay? And they need to know how to teach, okay? So at the primary level, how do you teach? What is the material? At this level, we're not talking about how do you teach that material. We're just talking about how do you teach and what is your material. But once we bring technology in, we bring in a third knowledge which is what is technology, how does it get used, what is it, how does it work? Things like, you know, if a student has a problem in the class when we're using technology, how can I solve that problem for them? You know, bits like that. So we're introducing a whole new knowledge set when we try to bring technology into a teacher's practice. And by bringing in that whole new knowledge set, we're also bringing in these subsets and these subsets are, so now we've got this subset here, which is the easy one, which is subset of content and pedagogy. So how do I teach this particular content? What's the best way to teach that content? But now we get into what is the right technologies to use for this particular content, okay? And how do I teach using technologies? You with me? And we put in a tertiary, a third one, which pulls them all together, which is around how do I weave all three of these things and all of these subsets together to really create a strong, cohesive learning experience for my students. And that gets even more difficult or more important if we're dealing in a world where we're using technology in the face-to-face -face space at the same time, or we're trying to have like a, a blended type approach where we've got a face-to-face -face environment and an online, we want those two things to be kind of the same. We don't want them to be two different environments, we want them to be one learning environment. How do we make it one space? Okay, so. I want you to now try to explain to someone else if you're close enough to them, if not, try and shimmy over a little bit, that model again of what I've just told you. Or you can ask a question first if you want to before you have to try and explain it to someone else. No? Okay, so jump in with someone else quickly and Spend a couple of minutes, explain this framework to somebody else and how, it, and how it relates to how teachers, when we bring technology into teaching practice, how it adds that extra knowledge and what that 
means. Okay, so if I could get you to flip around and maybe. Okay? So. You can talk about some yeah, and throw in some examples. It's, it's interesting, eh? Yeah, I really like this model. That's why I was like, what you're. Sorry, I'll turn this off. Yeah. 
Alright, finish up what you're thinking. Did any questions come up during your chat? No? You guys got it? Yeah? Can you explain technological, pedagogical content knowledge more? So how we understand the secondary levels like get Technological pedagogical knowledge? Technological pedagogical content knowledge right in the middle. Oh right in the middle? It's when we put all through all of them together. And so it's, how can I teach this particular content through technology in the most effective way possible? So, um, yeah, it's, it's when everything gets pulled in together. Because at this point, it's just, how do I teach effectively through technologies? But it doesn't have the content piece yet. Okay? And it's that third section, that tertiary bit when we pull the content in, so it brings that effectively with the content in. But great question. Anything? Yeah. Jamie and I were just talking about that one, actually. Yeah. And we were saying how at, at the events of COVID and having to go into that online learning space, that's what we were demanded to do as experts at. Mm. So to be able to bring all those technologies into space, so there's no other alternative. Yeah, really great question. Any other questions that have come up? Nobody wants to know where the A came from? Oh, yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's an and that just disappears in the literature all the time. Yeah. They just keep putting T pack, but they don't put the A for some reason. It's the and. So if we, use, if we use this as a, as a lens and we're applying this idea over and we're going to be trying try to be as nice and kind to Esther as we can, okay, we're not passing judgments, <laughs> but we're going to use some of the quotes from this wonderful resource that Esther's put together in this beautifully vulnerable document that was published. <laughs> She's my supervisor. <laughs> can we can we make any kind of comparisons? Can we see anywhere of how these two things could fit together? If we're layering the tea pack over here, what what kind of things could we possibly see? Yeah, sure. I may wonder if this is what we noticed was happening. What is the issue with this? Is, is there a synergy between this and TPAC, or is there, is there a gap? Mm. Okay. That's, um, that's what I'd be interested in. Like, what, what issues come out? This is what happens. How does this reflect or not reflect the TPAC? Like what is not happening in this space. Would that be right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like yeah. The not knowing is the thing, the not knowing how to use the technology, what technology or effective teaching learning. Mm. That's the gap. Yeah. Yeah. Suddenly we're throwing, we're throwing teachers into spaces where they weren't confident mm. and expecting them to just be well, to be in there, but also to, hey, nothing to see here, just carry on, just don't fall apart, just make it happen. Yeah? Um, and you, you were saying before, sorry, I didn't 
didn't catch your name, but suddenly, yeah, suddenly this, your whole world became your study. But maybe the same for the, you know, for the teachers. Suddenly, yeah, that's you know, such a good point. yeah, yeah. Yeah, suddenly the, everything you knew had changed is kind of what it, some of the words I'd heard. And the same for the educator. Yeah, everything has changed. And I'm now put into this world where I've got to have these new knowledges that I didn't have. I've got 60 hours to work it out, which is not long. It's really not long. But one of the things that's been really fascinating to watch and really wonderful to watch is the last couple of years how we've actually seen that development of that technological knowledge and that technological content knowledge, you know, all that TPAC, all of the technology pieces, and seen that growth through. You know, so the experience of this year, when we were in situations where we weren't able to be on campus, have been very different than 2020. Who, who was here in 2020? Have you noticed the difference in what's happening in the education space for you this year from what you experienced in 2020 and the lockdowns? Yeah, Matt? There's definitely, but there's never gone away the desire to return to what it was. I was a student in 2019. There's still no, that huge desire to return to the people I share that sort of thing. There are some And just to clarify, when, when he's just saying we, we're not meaning local, we're talking about the university. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So we're not saying, how has Esther done? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do we feel like there's been improvement in that space? Or are we still bumbling on? Yeah. keep in mind is that the pedagogy should drive the technology, not the other way around. Mm. Technology is a tool that we use. It shouldn't be the first consideration. It should be the second. It's what are we trying to do? How are we trying to achieve it? What do we want our learners to do? And then how can we do that? What are the tools that we've got available to us? In 2020, we had to flip that mm. because, well, the world caught fire. So we, we didn't have an option, right? We couldn't say, we're, not, we're going to do this a different way. It was like, and that's kind of the perfect example of when we have to put the technology first, we lose a lot of 
relational, what are we trying to achieve here? You know, the, Matt was saying just a second ago, you know, it wasn't about those learners at that time. It was, let's grab 2019 stuff and give it to the 2020 students because we just had to because everyone was just trying to survive. But I think if we're trying to look at it from a really positive and keeping, because I'm an optimist, I like to keep things positive. <laughs> what I think we've, what we've done, which is quite fascinating, is the, the experience through it is almost like we had two camps when we started out. We had the, the group that were just, and this is back in 2019, the group that were interested in technologies and were trying to push in that space, and those that were really resistant, were not interested, were not going to touch it at all. And it feels like we had to slow down the walker from this group and pick up a few more people. And now we can start moving forward into where we're heading. And we're kind of at the point now where we're starting to go back to, I feel, like at this point, we're, we're heading back to where we were getting to, or some people were starting to get to in about 2019. We were starting to push through in some really interesting new spaces. Uh, and some of the projects that we've been working on in the team I'm in, we're doing some really fascinating new things with people who were really resistant three years ago. Uh, so things that were just not going to be conceived of as possible. Uh, one of the projects, for instance, is teaching music fully online. So we've used technology to do pitch recognition. So on Canvas, you play your instrument or you sing, and this, we've embedded a technology into this course that says, no, you're slightly flat, or it's the right note or whatever. It's actually pit, you know, picking up that pitch so we can help teach music students without having them in the room. So then, but we still want them in the room. It's just an extra thing they can practice and have some experience with afterwards. So, I've called this bit murky visions of the future because what is our future going to be? Where are we heading? What do you think? Where do you think we're going? Where would you like us to go? Yeah. Do we want to go back to 1940? Do we want to go forward? Do we want to carry on with our magic lanterns? Are they great? Or you know, what, what do we want to do? Where do we want to go? I'm going to go as we can continue to develop so that it's more immersive and more interactive, so there's real connections with people, not just like content knowledge. Mm. And just getting that in, you know, teaching is such a important element. So you need that. Yeah. Yeah, how can we building those relationships? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Matt? I think that every student should be able to pick how they want to do their learning. If you want to come to lectures and watch them in person, there should be that option. If you want to watch them online, it should be your choice. If you want to do both, that should be a choice. Mm. I think every learner knows how they best learn. Mm. Mm. Some of my family have developed some really bad speaking 
<laughs> in regards to texting each other for each room, it's like, come on, <laughs> you know, just walk down the room and talk about using technology to communicate. Yep. It's just stupid. Yep, use it at the right times. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yeah, I think the classroom generates or activities or, or presential um, activities generates like something further or mm. you can engage more, you can just, uh, we could see the difference. Also it could be, I think, because I still our brain and our minds are get used to that, so we might need to re, or how you say, like modify like re, remake like this relationship between between technology and people and like we need to like modify how is the like mm -hmm. this relationship not also for example not to ruin things about like get it out about the moments without technology. Mm -hmm. So technology sometimes ruins things, for example, in classrooms with the kids, like ruins the... So for example, new generations need to like relate in a different way and they still do it differently because like I grew up without cell phone when I was young, so it makes a big difference how I relate. So, and with our new generations, they they are already with that, mm. so they are creating a new. So it's something, yeah, it's balance because these spaces give us quite a lot and teach us many things. We can, yeah, communication is not just words and the information, it's how we, yeah, we are here and, mm. yeah, engage. Yeah. Nice. I've just been trying to remember, and I finally remembered it. Matt, what you were talking about before reminds me of a model, and I was trying to remember the name of it. We were looking, or research was looking at something called HyFlex. That's the bit I was trying to remember, which was really popular around 2018. The idea being students could be in the classroom at the time. They could be, as they could be synchronously beaming in from off-site. Off so, for instance, we'd have this lecture right now. We'd have students via Zoom that would be sending chat messages so they could interact via chat, but also those that didn't want to interact at that time would be able to interact later on, and not just through watching the, not just watch the video, but there'd be activities they could do as well. Mm -hmm. So that was a really popular idea in 2018 that kind of got a bit, a bit lost. I was trying to remember the name of it before I came back to you. Hyflex? Hi yeah. Yeah, and I, I think from reading your narratives from last week, um, it's, it was interesting for Danny and I to see who would be here this mm. morning, who chose to come, and and similarly with the with the tutorials, um, because a lot of students have learned that they learn better now. You know, going through the crisis time, they've said, "No, I'm a better learner on my own um, through using the technology," mm. and so they they that's how they've decided that they learn better. And others. Um, really need that embodied interaction. And so I, I agree with you, Matt. But the problem with this yeah. with this design is for someone like Jamie and I, we get a couple of couple of hours of work plate to actually design something. And to create something that's gonna fit all those diverse needs, which is would be great, mm. wouldn't it? It really would be. Um, is really huge yeah. and, and a big lot of um, learning that would need to occur for me mm. in particular. Uh, but would be great. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone else want to speculate about the future? What about some of you ones at the back here? What, what, how do you best like to communicate? How do you communicate with friends? What's, your, what's the best way you'd like to communicate with them? I 
he ticks a lot. You know, so for who here would text be your first mode of communication with your friends? Yeah. Okay. What about um, is it Instagram? Right. Twitter. Who likes to communicate with Twitter? I'm going to tell another professor one of that's out now. It's going to. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's interesting as well watching that there's certain ages where certain things switch. So WhatsApp was massive for a short time. And now it's just, I don't hear of anyone really using WhatsApp anymore. Um, My great dips use it. So they, are, they range from about 25 to mm. 40. Yeah. Snapchat was huge for a while, but yeah. I don't know. Does anyone still using Snapchat quite a bit for communication? A little bit? Okay. Mm. Okay, so probably start to wrap things up. Um, the key things that I really want to take you to take out of today is that SAMR model and the TPAC. Those are the two main things. So did anyone have any questions around those two before we kick off? Yeah, do you want to go into the Canvas assignment and then they can just have, ask you what you might think about that task? Mm. So your task for this week, because you can come and join us on Thursday, but we won't have a um, tutorial today. Oh yeah. So where's, where is it? It's, it's up on assignments. Yes, yeah, so you can go back into the... Uh... Oh, look at it here, isn't it beautiful? Into the assignments. Yeah, and that last one here. Yeah. This one? Yeah. So what we've done here is we've taken the model that Jamie showed you on this uh, CMR model. And again, um, getting you to think about, we started this conversation this morning anyway, on how you might describe and these sorts of examples that you've seen I've got the right, is it really definition? Is that right? Yep. Good. Yep. So you've got some questions for Jamie from Rats before we close. Yeah, statistics. Uh, when I was working last year, the statistics had such an amazing software so we can all do things at the same time of the Mm. Of the class, I found it quite useful and interactive. And mm. Yeah. The statistics. Yes, the statistics. Do you know what program we're using? Oh, so. I've just changed it. They use quite a few tools in mm. the class to, as we were doing here, like yeah. everyone. I like the, like the good group. Answer and they have like in, yeah because it's the computer do the instant thing so it's it's nice interactive how mm. everyone was uh, yeah commenting or yeah just at the at the same time that. yep so be interesting Egon isn't it Egon interesting to yeah. go to go back and look at the different tools that your statistic lecturers were using. I think, was that one a substitution, or was that one a mm. or was it a modification, or was it a redefinition? And, and put them in, in relation yeah. to this model. So the things that you've been experiencing in your online experiences, what, where would they fit in this model? Mm. Yeah, is that an example of a substitution? Yeah. yeah. So as I was saying at the start, what, what I've done is put in this, which is a in your Canvas course, which is uh, basically everything we've been through, but just kind of laid out a little differently than you might be used to. So, um, so sort of hotspots around um, and then you can just navigate through. So a bit about the stuff we've talked about. And there's the stuff that we created earlier. I didn't go through this poll, I decided not to today which was around what your experience was, but you can add that in if you like, around have you ever done any 
what kind of courses you've been involved in, uh, that timeline, and things are available in here. Do you still want me to add my PowerPoint presentation? Yeah? Most of it's going to be in there, so I'd say look at this stuff first, but I'll put the slides up. So that's where you say the master knowledge. Uh, so that's when you first go in. Oh, that's the teaching within three technologies. Yeah. 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 Mm. yeah so it'll just come up and say yeah, there and just go open. And then it's all kind of in there. Right. Okay. Otherwise, I've, I'm pretty much done. If you've got anything you need to go through, Esther. Or if there's any questions. Do you have any questions or comments for Jamie? Do you do well? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. And I'll see you next week for Xandry. So, free now to go and do the own place to do the response. So, we're done.